What's going on AP students? Let's study the history of political parties in America from the 1700s to the 1800s. How about we begin with the Federalist Party, which traces its roots with the Washington administration. Speaking of Washington, it's very interesting. In his farewell address, he actually warned Americans to not join political parties, to stay unified, don't divide up um, with partisan politics, and then we promptly do the exact opposite. The Federalist Party, think about founding fathers like Alexander Hamilton promoting a big government, loose interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, using implied powers. Think about the Bank of the United States, the very first one. Was that actually word for word written in the Constitution? It wasn't there, but they used the elastic clause to say it was necessary and proper for the benefit of our country, and they get it passed. They argue that the wealthy and intellectual elite should be in power. They advocate close ties with Great Britain. And then they also will find their strongest support in the North. In response to this strong central democracy, you have the formation of the Democratic Republicans, led by people like Thomas Jefferson, advocating states' rights, promoting enumerated powers, a very strict interpretation of the Constitution. If it's not explicitly written in the Constitution, word for word, then we shouldn't be doing it. They will promote agricultural and rural rights. They'll be very supportive of France. Again, they helped us in the American Revolution, so we should help them in any of their affairs if they need something from us. They are advocates of civil liberties. They question a very strong government. They argued that common people should be a part of the government. They're very capable of ruling, and you'll see their strong support will be in the South and in the West. What happened to the Federalist Party, and why exactly do we not see the Federalist Party anymore? They decline after something called the Hartford Convention takes place and the War of 1812. Federalist representatives at the Hartford Convention not only opposed the war, but they talked of potentially seceding at that particular meeting. So in the days following the Battle of New Orleans, Americans came to believe that they quote unquote won the War of 1812. So now the Federalist Party looks like losers for opposing the war, but they also look like traitors for potentially talking about secession as well. Let's get to the second two-party system. So let's fast forward to the age of Jackson. Jackson ran in 1828 and 1832, um, forming a new party, the Democratic Party. Now, to begin off with, he's facing against John Quincy Adams in 1828, National Republican. This party was founded as the Common Man's Party, running against big government, banks, the, the influence of the wealthy elite, and um, you'll see themes, again, of Jeffersonian agrarians, uh, kind of a farming type of a situation going on with it. They advocate common man rule, territory expansion, and then you'll see, again, very strong support from the South and in the West. The remnants of the old Federalist Party will go on to form the Whig Party. This is the party of modernization. Let's improve the economy through better banking, through better transportation. Let's build those canals and build those roads. Let's advocate reforms such as temperance, prison reform, school reform. You'll see a very big partnership with businesses and industry, strong entrepreneurship. And so, again, a lot of northern support. They will eventually grow as we get closer to the 1850s to favor territorial expansion as well. So as a note, the Democratic Republicans became simply known as the Democrats as a result of Jackson's running against John Quincy Adams. So we're going to drop that name Democratic Republicans, we're going to stick with Democrats from there forward. As we get close to the Civil War, you'll start to see things divide out amongst political parties. So controversies over slavery will change America's two-party system for, uh, for a good while as we get closer to the, the eventual Civil War. Starting with the Liberty Party, this is an abolitionist platform in 1844, wins 2% of the vote, but draws much support from the old Whigs and also from the North. You also have the formation of the Free Soil Party. They are the precursor to the Republican Party. They, um, they oppose the expansion of slavery, but not uh, uh, just banning outright slavery itself. Martin Van Buren won 10% of the popular vote in 1848, but they will lose support when the party uh, disagrees over the eventual compromise of 1850. Whigs. They're still around, but they're also going to split over the issue of slavery. You've got cotton Whigs that support the extension of slavery. You've got conscience Whigs that oppose the expansion of slavery, but not banning slavery itself. You've got the cotton Whigs that will go and branch off into future Democrats. You'll have conscious Whigs that will branch off into future free soilers and Republicans as well. So usually when you see a party divide, you'll see it. You'll see the end of it. You'll see their influence fade. 
um, and you'll see them decline as a whole. You have the American Party that's also forming on a platform of nativism, restricting immigrants, anti-Catholic feelings amongst the Know Nothing Party. Um, many of these people will also join the Republican Party as well after the election of 1856, continuing on with mid-19th century political crisis over slavery. Let's keep with the topic of the Republican Party. They do run um, in 1854, Coalition of Democrats, Free Soilers, and Conscious Whigs, all in opposition to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. They're going to form in response to that particular moment right there. But again, they're, they're kind of uh, the precursor to it all is the, the, the Free Soil Party. So again, this party, they, they, they oppose the expansion of slavery, but not the banning of slavery itself. The rumor amongst a lot of people was that they would eventually ban slavery, and so that a lot of opposition will be um, there for the Republican Party because of that one moment. So although slavery was immoral, it did have a right to exist to argue that. And you'll have a lot of kind of moderate candidates like Lincoln that will argue that, although I believe it's immoral. I'm not going to interfere with its right to exist where it already does exist in places like Alabama or Mississippi. John C. Fremont runs in the national election uh, for president in 1856, loses to James Buchanan, but Two years later, the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, um, running for senator, senator of Illinois, Abraham Lincoln will go up against the, the little giant named Stephen Douglas, running for the Democrats. Although Lincoln does not win that particular election, he does quite well in those debates. So he will become the face of the Republican Party going forward into the 1860 election. So again, very strong support from the North by 1860. As we get to the famous election of 1860, the Democratic Party is still around. They're still hanging on to the agrarian vision, advocating states' rights, opposition to any sort of government intervention with slavery. By 1860, though, they're going to start to split on a platform of defending slavery, which was rejected by some um, Democrats prior to the election. For example, Stephen Douglas will run on a campaign of popular sovereignty. John Breckinridge is pro-slavery. And so you'll see the Democrats will be hurt by that in the famous election of 1860. So as a final note, Lincoln wins the 1860 election without any support from the southern states. This is kind of the final straw for South Carolina as they secede and then um, the eventual uh, secession of many other states forming the Confederate States of America. Okay, after the Civil War, Gilded Age politics. I can tell you right now, not a lot happens. There's not a lot of major news in the late 1800s. You've got Democrats and Republicans that still exist. Um, but if you, as you should notice here, both of them pro-business, both opposed to major economic reform. Both of them advocated the status quo in the financial sector. Here's the difference, though. During this time period, Democrats will dominate the House of Representatives while Republicans dominate the Senate. What that eventually means is that, well, there's not a lot of legislation that's going to be passed during the late 1800s. These are kind of your forgettable presidents. I have a mistake on here. You'll notice they're half-breeds. There's actually need to add in stalwarts, but mugwumps. You can see even the Republicans are a little bit divided as well in their own beliefs. This leads to the rise of a group called the Populist Party, formed in 1891 out of the Farmers Alliance. They are wanting actually more government intervention. They want free coinage of silver. Bimetallism is a big theme of the Populist Party, one of the most successful third parties you'll ever see in U.S. history. Government ownership of railroad telegraphs, so forth, graduated income tax, direct election of senators, initiative referendum, and recall. Um, their popularity will fade after the 1896 election with William Jennings Bryan. Think back to the old famous Cross of Gold speech that we've studied in class. Just as a note, although they lost the 1892 and 1896 elections, many of these ideas, like the direct election of senators and so forth, will actually become law by the future progressives. So that's a good stopping place. I hope you see by the late 1800s, politics was in gridlock. There was a stalemate that was happening. But what's interesting is the rise of this third party, the Populist Party, which, which will make a huge difference as we get into politics in the 1900s. All right, I hope this was very helpful. If you still have questions, please let me know. Thanks for watching.